Bonjour et bienvenue, je suis Elfie Turpin, je suis directrice du CRAC Alsace Centre Rénan d'Art Contemporain à Alkirch en France. Je suis membre du comité de pilotage de cette première édition de l'Assemblée européenne des centres d'art contemporain et co-présidente de DCA, Association française de développement des centres d'art. Cette rencontre est entièrement bilingue, français, anglais, donc je vais introduire en français, mais les intervenantes vont parler en anglais. J'ai donc le grand plaisir d'ouvrir cette première Assemblée européenne des centres d'art contemporains en cette date du 8 mars. En effet, depuis 2015, le réseau DCA tisse des relations avec des institutions artistiques en Europe en partageant des valeurs et des questions communes. De cette reconnaissance mutuelle est né le désir de faire assembler en impulsant des temps réguliers de réflexion collective ouvert à toutes et tous, publics, professionnels de l'art, autour de grandes problématiques qui traversent nos quotidiens par-delà la diversité des contextes auxquels nos structures sont confrontées. Initialement conçu pour se tenir sous la forme d'un grand rassemblement sur deux journées à Paris en mai 2020 autour de la question des inégalités de genre au sein des institutions artistiques et repoussé en crise en raison de la crise sanitaire, cette édition inaugurale se tient six mois-ci en ligne cette crise sanitaire en exacerbant toutes les formes d'inégalité et de discrimination a rendu d'autant plus nécessaire la réflexion sur ces enjeux dans notre écosystème artistique. À la crise sanitaire s'ajoute aujourd'hui la, la guerre en Ukraine. Alors je voulais en dire quelques mots avant de commencer. On ne peut pas commencer cette, cette assemblée européenne sans évoquer la brutale invasion militaire en cours en Ukraine, sans affirmer notre solidarité au peuple ukrainien et à notre endroit à la communauté artistique. De nombreuses actions et initiatives naissent un peu partout en Europe. Je voulais vous dire que le, le réseau français euh, des centres d'art contemporain est en train de recenser les capacités d'accueil de ses membres afin de pouvoir proposer à terme des temps de résidence artistique en faveur des artistes et professionnels en provenance du territoire ukrainien. Nous travaillons en lien avec l'artiste Christina Solomouka, artiste franco-ukrainienne basée à Paris, afin d'évaluer avec elle les nécessités, les besoins de, de la communauté artistique avec laquelle elle est en contact permanent. Lors de notre dernière conversation hier, elle me rapportait le, le fait que pour l'heure, la circulation étant très réduite, euh, les artistes euh, s'engagent et euh, entrent en résistance sur, euh, sur le territoire. Dans ce contexte très troublé, l'ambition de cette Assemblée est de déconstruire les conditions structurelles, matérielles, qui perpétuent au sein de l'écosystème artistique des inégalités de genre, de sexe, de classe, de race, pour n'en citer que quelques-unes, et qui génèrent des pratiques institutionnelles, institutionnelles discriminantes. Il s'agira dans le même temps de partager des outils, des idées, des actions de transformation et des méthodologies qui permettent de lutter contre ces multiples formes de discrimination, de domination et de développer des pratiques instituant des relations réellement équitables. Pour ce faire, nous avons donc, nous avons donc invité des professionnels de, de l'art, des artistes, des commissaires d'exposition, des critiques, des directeurs d'institutions intellectuelles, chercheurs, chercheuses, afin de débattre et partager idées, inspirations au sein d'un programme de quatre rencontres en ligne, dont nous sommes en train d'ouvrir la, la première. Ils seront mobilisés de multiples approches et pratiques féministes animant la sphère culturelle. Quand je dis nous, j'évoque le comité de pilotage qui a construit ce programme et qui est composé de Marianne Hultmann, directrice artistique de l'Oslo Kunstverening en Norvège, Antonio Cataldo, directeur artistique de Photogalerite à Oslo, Philippa Oliveira, directrice artistique du Centre d'art Casa da Cerca et de la Galerie d'art municipale d'Almada au Portugal, Manuel Segade, directeur du CA2M, Centro do Arte dos de Mayo à Mostolas en Espagne, Ursula Chandolin, curatrice indépendante, directrice pendant de longues années de la Kunzverein Langenhagen, puis du Kunzverein Heidelberger jusqu'en 2021. Je les remercie pour leur immense et inoxydable implication dans ce projet. Les prochaines dates de rencontre se tiendront les 12 avril, 10 mai, 7 juin. Vous trouverez toutes les informations sur le site internet europeanartassembly.org qui a été designé par Lauren Furter. Cette session est enregistrée et sera mise en ligne sur ce site. 
Cet événement en ligne n'aurait pu voir le jour sans les soutiens du ministère de la Culture français, de l'Institut français, de la Fondation des artistes. Sa clôture physique prévue à l'automne 2022 à Paris bénéficiera également d'un soutien dédié de la mission RSO pilotée par Agnès Salle au ministère de la Culture, qu'elle en soit ici sincèrement remerciée, ainsi que Delphine Fournier, François Quintin, Simon André de Conchat et Isabelle Delamont pour le ministère, Marie-Cécile Burnichon, Josie Tinella et Adeline Blanchard pour l'Institut français, Laurence Meignet pour la Fondation des artistes. Cette assemblée est organisée en collaboration avec le réseau des Kunzereine en Allemagne, ADKV, le réseau des centres d'art en Norvège, Kunsthalle Inorge, et les institutions artistiques Photogalerit à Oslo, Oslo Kunzerunning, CA2M en Espagne, Casa da Cerca au Portugal. Un grand merci à ces organisations. Je remercie également l'équipe de DCA, Marie Chenal, Chloé Monron et Lénie Pantelaras pour la mise en œuvre de cette assemblée. Alors, nous avons aujourd'hui l'honneur d'écouter Angela Dimitra Kaki euh, en conversation avec euh, Xavier Arakistein, puis euh, euh, pardon, en conversation avec Elke Krasny, puis euh, Xavier Arakistein en dialogue avec euh, Elisabeth Lebovici. Ces deux discussions de 40 minutes euh, chacune seront suivies d'une session en questions-réponses de 17h à 17h30 et sont modérées par Julia Morandera. Euh, Julia Morandera est chercheuse, curatrice. Elle est actuellement curatrice du programme post-académique de bac à Utrecht et enseigne au sein euh, du Dutch Art Institute à la Arthes University of the Arts aux Pays-Bas. Julia Morandera a publié de nombreux textes sur les intersections entre la théorie critique, les études culturelles et les pratiques artistiques et éducatives. Sa pratique s'articule autour de projets de recherche curatoriale au long cours qui se matérialisent à travers de multiples formats, structures et gestes tels que « Cannibalia »,« Be careful with each other so we can be dangerous together ». Uh, nothing is true, everything is alive, ou encore Night Studies, pour n'en citer que quelques-uns. Julia, je te cède la parole. Thank you so much, Elfie, for this very generous introduction. And without much further ado, I would like to welcome again uh, Angela Dimitrakaki and Elke Krasny, our first two guests, to actually delve in the different questions regarding gender and labor that occupy us today. Angela is a writer and art historian working across feminism and Marxism, and she's senior lecturer in contemporary art history and theory at the University of Edinburgh. Elke Krasny is a feminist cultural theorist, urban researcher, curator, and author. She's professor of art and education at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. You can find the more extensive biographies in the in the, in the European Assembly uh, website that you can find the links both in French and in English in the chat. So Angela and Elke, both of you have examined in your work the long and convoluted genealogies of gendered labor in the artistic and cultural field from different perspectives that meet each other and that intersect. So fueled by rampant neoliberalism and also the lurking precarity, the cultural and artistic work practices and its institution still uphold today greatly this gendered unequal divide of labor, as can be seen not only the gender inequality present in direct impositions or economic retributions, but also in the important amount of invisibilized and enthusiasm driven work it feeds on. A work that is traditionally perceived as feminized and largely undertaken by precarious bodies. So this underlying reality still stands in stark contrast with the glorification of a few successful individuals, the proliferation of exhibitions of women artists or feminist thematic, or the widespread and mainstream endorsement of feminism and social justice by art institutions. This is a general picture that the pandemic has violently exposed and in many aspects worse. Although I want to believe that it has also opened some cracks for fem feminist intervention, transformation, and speculation that will, I would like to tap on in the conversations today. So maybe as a kickoff question, I would like to ask you what are, in your opinion, the urgent questions regarding gender and labor in the artistic field that we should be tackling? Why are the masculinist grammars still haunting this field? And what are the wounds that need to be addressed and repaired? 
Okay. Um, thank you, Julia. I don't know if I should start or if Elke. Uh, right. Okay. Um, I will then. It's uh, after thanking you, of course. Um, thank you to everyone um, who is here. Um, in such difficult times, uh, thank you to the organizers for the invite. So um, it's already a rich um, question. Um, in our own discussions, um, we agreed that um, in response to these questions, we would um, maximum come up with like, you know, three points we want to stress as a response and that we need to develop. So um, as regards myself, um, I would start by stressing the need to rethink and understand um, in a new way the history of art institutions in relation to feminist politics. We know, of course, that it is very hard to maintain clarity. Um, at this age, we call it for a long time an accelerated um, age, an, an age of accelerated political change, where we constantly see the, the slide of biopolitics into necropolitics. And there's much denial in confronting um, what is the old, you know, that is dying. A lot, a lot of people talk about that. And what is the new that may be born? Um, and I think that for feminist colleagues today in the very violently revived geographies of Eastern Europe, right? Um, there, there's no International Women's Day. And they say so publicly in the, in the media, in the social media. Um, they say it because feminism had been so pacified um, in the age of alleged liberalism as to appear irrelevant at a moment such as the one we're speaking from, which is a moment of war. So the liberal understanding of globalization, which is a concept I have worked a lot with, is exhausted. It's exhausted um, because globalization is transforming into, has been transforming for some time now, into a multipolar, or in this case, tripolar is what we see, Interimperialism and totalitarian capitalism, which is a term in circulation, um, at least in, since uh, 2010. So I would say that the first task for feminism now is to interpret the political juncture so the strategies concerning the advance of feminist values that have been under attack for a long time um, continue as a realistic possibility, because I, I, I don't think we have the luxury to assume that we will exist. And um, to do this, we first thing I need, uh, we, we first need to, to rethink the trajectory of feminism throughout the 20th century, the political and economic pressures um, under which it formed. And I think that this task is more pronounced where, where it concerns the links between second wave and the post financial crisis, the post-2008 feminist social movements, for in my view, feminism, the feminism that crosses uh, the art field, is there to serve feminism as a social movement, like the people who are in the streets right now. So it's not an inward looking um, affair, let's say. It's not about a sector specific inward looking policy. Now in an article which um, was, um, I was commissioned about uh, for EFLEX journal in 2018, I placed emphasis on the contradictions um, faced by feminism in the art field. And I argue that almost all, or in fact, all emancipatory movements face the same contradictions. At that point, however, I had not read because it was coming out at the same time, Susan Watkins exemplary research article, which feminisms, uh, which came out in New Left Review and which explained in no uncertain terms the trajectory of feminism by considering the hegemony of capitalism and America. So looking at the development of what we call global capitalism, we see that um, Watkins, Susan Watkins demonstrated a few things that in my view, at least, we should now try to connect to the history of feminism in the art field because she didn't deal with art at all. I think this is for us to do. Um, so for instance, how ideas and concepts and practices that we, uh, to which we thought we were drawn to naturally, right, and freely adopted them, emanated in fact from a very carefully planned, guided, and crucially very well-funded integration <laughs> project. And they did the same to the civil rights movement and the same to feminism. So Watkins demonstrated, for instance, how from the outset neoliberalism and the Chicago School 
uh, of economics, sought to remove women's liberation from the streets um, and develop instead an institutionalized feminism. And she examined how powerful foundations, such as the Ford Foundation, uh, they poured millions into um, developing academic posts, journals, uh, such as science, you know, and how they favored specific discourses, such as intersectionality um, in American feminism. See, also, it's a very long article, so it's like over 70 pages, right? So it's like a small book. <laughs> you need a long, <laughs> a, few, a few pages to narrate all this. And she also looked at how this dominant model of American feminism was exported and dominated the global scene. And I remember actually in one of my first trips um, to uh, Hungary, um, when I met a very well-known historian there, she told me, I was glad to have feminism because it's thought of as non-politics. So that is how <laughs> it was, it was, um, it arrived, it was exported. And so what's the lesson to be learned from Susan Watkins' analysis? I think, um, the observation of Father Lord that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, um, which comes from the late 70s, it needs to be taken very seriously in helping us search into the ideological overdetermination of feminist goals that I think we like <laughs> and we have freely chosen. So, um, would be hard pressed, and I think for me, this is very interesting, and I stand, of course, to be corrected, but I think would be hard pressed to find feminist or historical texts speaking about um, strategies in the 70s and 80s, which would mention and analyze neoliberalism. And yet neoliberalism developed at the very same time, exactly as feminism um, was coming through the second wave into, into art history and so on. And of course, people, people were very young at the time who were involved, um, extremely dynamic, but it was very hard to see neoliberalism playing a key role there. So um, I think the lack of this analysis at the time, because later, of course, people started mentioning it, uh, permitted an integration program for feminism that meant also the pacification of feminist opposition on militant side, which lasted for a few years, but then I think it subsided. And this had a huge impact on how art feminism developed under American hegemony and the star of postmodernism, of course. So labor, which was there, and we can see it very clearly also in analysis and the work of very uh, prominent uh, women artists, feminist artists, in fact, it ceased being of interest from a point onwards. And what dominated, I would say, sexuality, consumption, and so on. Labor uh, re revived as a key point after, not only after 2000, at least I've seen it after uh, 2008, you know, when capitalism crisis began being felt in advanced economies. Now I will move, I've written actually quite a few things, but I will, because um, <laughs> I want Elke to talk and I, I'm aware we've got very little time. Uh, the second point I want to stress in relation to the masculinism that, you know, is there in the system is that um, we need to resist the values, even at the level of policy that sustain contemporary capitalism and especially competition. As feminists, we have accepted um, funding and um, uh, funding policies from the EU as well, or from everywhere where we pit one woman or one institution against the next, um, about who is going to, uh, to, to get the very little funding, you know, that uh, comes um, arts uh, way. And I think this, at this point, uh, because with the remitilarization yes, of Europe, um, we will have uh, less money, right? Less funding for the arts. This can be certain. I'm sure we're all following the news and we know uh, what is happening, for instance, in Germany and elsewhere. Um, so um, there's gonna be um, less money for, for culture. This is definitely the prediction because we need more bombs and, and, and so on. So um, in case we, we survive, I think we need, um, to very firmly uh, demand, even at a very practical level, policies that move us away from this uh, competition. I had argued elsewhere about the need for a curatorial commons 
um, about a different approach to exhibition making, but I'm not going to expand on this here. Um, I think what I need to stress is that we, we do have analysis, such as the very famous one by Greg Cholet already from 2010, where he talked about the great, the great dark mass of invisible arts producers, right? Um, which are there, they have to be there so that they allow the few stars to shine. Yes, it's interesting to see that this a dark mass developed um, together with a so-called democratization <laughs> of the art field and also with the influx of women because uh, there used to be a time when you know women were that much in, in art schools and there's tons of research, uh, feminist historical research on that. Uh, but now, as we all know, it is a feminized um, um, study, uh, kind of like context, and it's a feminized profession, right? So um, I think we need to um, have this policy U-turn there. And with it, we need, of course, to um, rethink the premises of wh what we mean by art workers. If everyone who's involved in the arts as uh, an arts producer is an art worker, or whether we have, for instance, differentiations, we need to understand that meritocracy um, is, which uh, allows us, not allows us, it pushes us to kind of like celebrate every time, um, for instance, a non-white um, artist gets something or a working class artist gets a prize and so on. And it's a token presence, of course, um, because this person was so extremely, uh, such an extremely good artist and they were worth it. I think we need to really rethink all this and understand the extent to which it has been functioning as um, a capitalist value, meritocracy. So um, actually together with Nizam Saked, we discussed this in a recent article we co-authored for On Curating, which is um, dedicated to, um, to instituting feminism, not institutions of feminism, but instituting feminism. And there were more, more theoretical, uh, more than I would have the chance to be here. I think that my third point, which uh, concern, co concerns this idea of what, what are the wounds to be repaired? And this, this was a, a very uh, difficult question to, to, to answer, even to think of, let alone answer. And I think that um, for many years now, we have been um, hearing about feminisms rather than feminism. And I would say that this is, um, a legacy of the alliance between postmodernism and feminism, this uh, diversity of feminisms, uh, which eventually locked feminism into so-called identity politics. But if we are to think about feminism as the end of uh, women's suppression, of course, women, sometimes women, I mean, a social subject, right? And exploitation, we can no longer proceed like this. The pluralization of feminism into feminisms has been used as the system's chief strategy of divide and conquer. It has landed us into a situation where we encounter, uh, we encounter phrases that constitute contradictions in terms such as imperialist <laughs> feminism or neoliberal um, feminism and so on, and um, or white uh, feminism. So can we then seriously imagine or accept a fascist feminism, I mean, if we are to adjectivize and so on. And I think that um, the pluralization of feminisms came, uh, kind of like became prominent um, so that we could avoid a discussion and indeed a debate about what a feminist horizon is. And, and we accepted the parallel feminisms, right? Um, that can be antithetical to each other, so that we wouldn't really have to think really what feminism um, is about and how reform um, strategies would meet this big like feminist um, horizon. So for me, um, it is in the, we, we, I think we need a feminist realism, okay, that looks really dialectically at women's role in production and social production, so that we um, arrive, okay, we don't need to agree on everything, but we need to, uh, through this feminist realism, um, kind of mend the fractures of feminism, kind of de-diversify in many ways, and um, kind of constantly discuss, you know, what it is 
where it is that um, that we're moving or that we might want to, to move. So it's the internal fractures of feminism, I think, um, that I would like, these are the wounds to be repaired uh, for me in the first uh, instance. So I will stop here and thank you very much for tolerating this, this long response. Yeah, so I, I can I can also share the, the points that I reflected upon bef be, before um, we, we came together here, but I would immediately like to comment on some of the things that Angela just said before I move to what I have prepared. So I think it's really important to, to, to think, and not only to think, but also to, to act against um, this neoliberalization of mind and bodies. Um, that, that has been so deeply um, entrenched and normalized by a lot of human beings that, that it's no longer even seen or understood. So I think this is like a, an invisible poison that, that in a way um, also needs to be called out and to make understood what it actually does, how it erodes um, imagining life differently. So I think this is something that I really want to stress. And competition is its most important ingredient. When we find ourselves in competition with each other for everything, um, the, the result is individuals in total isolation. So, so in a way, the pandemic has, uh, has made that a lived reality, but I think the isolation was there before. Um, the isolation that is drawn by, by boundaries um, that we erect in order to protect. And so when we look at all these, these things together, the competition, the protection, the withdrawal into safety in order to win, um, I think we need a lot of realism. When I'm being realistic, most people think I'm pessimistic, but, um, but I think uh, we also have to understand how realism um, can actually become, and maybe we can talk more about that, a source of um, optimism, not in the sense of a utopian thinking of something that will never be attained, but an optimism that, that is based on something that understands that we cannot take anything for granted, as Angela has actually stressed several times, you said, we may not be there in the future, or we cannot take for granted that there is a continuation of what there is. And I think this is maybe the most important point for feminism um, today, to, to not take anything for granted um, to, to not uh, rely on a sense of, um, so in the world where I live, I live in Central Europe, I would say there's a certain kind of welfare entitlement, which, which is not um, solidarity, but very much uh, the me, 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 everything for me, but not for others. So now I come to the points and, and um, they, they will be short. So, so thinking about uh, the fact that we are coming together to think about the role and the importance, the, the social function, the artistic function, the cultural function of contemporary art centers, I, I, I thought back in history really in a very uh, long and trans-historical way. Um, and I would say what, what I would um, try to think about is that um, contemporary art centers are still confronted today contemporaneously with the fact that um, during a certain formation of what we call Western and European modernity, life was actually split from art. And art was also not considered labor, but it was something separate, something that was called um, autonomous, um, that, that was no longer embedded in, in the lived uh, realities. And I, I would say this split has masculinist uh, implications to, to go back to the question you asked, Julia. But I think it's also part of the wound, um, this, this rift that we have life in general, and then we have this little protected thing that we call art. And, and there are huge epistemic and, and, and cultural um, structures that were built around that, such as um, disciplines um, like art history or 
collecting institutions like museums. And even though contemporary art centers are different from both art history and museums, they are, I think, implicated in, 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 in what these disciplines and institutions have created um, in the past. And I would argue that um, the marginalized majority, so that's another way of saying the 99%. So, so the marginalized majority, most of them women, but, but not only women, were, were excluded from the onset on uh, from this very notion of who makes art and what art actually is. And this has of course been challenged as we all know, but I think it has always only been challenged that there hasn't ever, so maybe you, you can correct me on this, but I think there hasn't ever been a system that is really radically different. Um, so there's a lot of challenging and undoing and unmaking and unlearning, um, but I think there wasn't um, an easy way of saying, well, we want art as part of life. And so in a way with some kind of, um, maybe it's unrealistic, but I would still like to, to think that it's possible that if art can become part of everyday life, uh, uh, contemporary art centers will have to work very differently from the way they work today. Not all of them, there are many examples. And there are people here like you, Julia, who work in art centers who do things very, very differently. So, so I think one also shouldn't overgeneralize. So I'm saying that to myself, not to others. Um, the second point that I would like to make is that um, I would like to, to think, um, with others, um, so, so all the things I'm talking about, we can never solve them alone. I think that that was made very clear also in what was Angela, Angela was saying. So, so, so it's not the burden of the individual to solve these things. We can, either we will solve them collectively or we are doomed to not solve them. So, so what are feminist issues? And, and I started writing a list which could of course go on forever, but I will just share the first few points. And I start with, gender is a feminist issue. So, so gender is not women. So very often when people say gender, they think about one gender only. They don't think about um, genders in plural. So I think that is a feminist issue. Infrastructure, I would say is very much a feminist issue. And that has become so very clear uh, in pandemic times, in times of war, in times of austerity, in times of what is called um, downsizing, I think, also one of these terrible euphemisms. Um, cleaning is very much a feminist issue. So who, who cleans the art centers um, and um, who doesn't? Um, leadership is a feminist issue. Who, who becomes um, active in a leadership role and who can fill it maybe differently? Programming is a feminist issue when we think about art centers. I think funding is very much a feminist issue and we were already there how we are complicit and compliant with mechanisms through which we obtain what, what is called money. Uh, resources are a feminist issue. Representation, that has been discussed for a very, very long time, but I think infrastructure less so. Publics, audiences, communities are feminist issues. What will take so all those who are producing and reproducing the, what will it take so all those who are producing and reproducing the institutions of contemporary art centers understand these issues as feminist. So I think of everyday labor that needs to change in order to change and transform centers. And I don't think of interventions. Interventions are very much a militarized, militaristic masculinist term. I don't like them much. Um, and also it um, reminds me very often of the medical realm where an intervention is something that is super urgently needed. So, so we can invoke all these associations, but I think we talk a lot more about long-term dedicated transformation and that's not done with an intervention. And we know that from the medical situation, after an intervention, the real healing um, begins. Uh, my third point um, looks at the word gendered and it's very short. Um, so I'm starting off with climate change is gendered and, and I invite you to think what does that mean to art centers? I mean, of course we can think about the planet but we are here to think about contemporary art centers. 
So when I'm saying climate change is gendered, how would a contemporary art center think about that in the way they allocate resources, in the way they reduce their carbon footprint, so in very practical ways. COVID-19, of course, is immensely gendered, and there have been tons and tons of pages written about that. Policy has been written about it. Uh, the actual change, we haven't really seen it happen yet, that, that it will become a more equitable world. War is extremely gendered, austerity is gendered, capitalism is gendered, fascism is gendered, and so on and so forth. So again, this is one of the lists that can go on endlessly. And the question I have added here um, in response to, to the urgency you asked us about, Julia, is how can and will contemporary art centers re respond to historic junctures? So very often programming is done in yearly, bi-yearly, even three-yearly um, chunks of time. But when something is happening here and now, how can we respond in the here and now, but also in a more long-term and sustained way? So in a way, I'm trying to think, how do contemporary art centers respond to the now time, to historic junctures or ruptures, to futurity and to what you actually invited us to do, the not yet. So what, what is not here yet, but what we might want to insist on that we can actually think about it. And, and I'll stop here so that we have time for conversing and um, speculating maybe. Thank you so much for, um, for these very thought provoking points. I maybe just to take the cue from this last question, Elke, I would like to stick to the with the question of temporality. What is the the different temporalities of feminist work and change that we need to stay with? No, beyond immediacy and urgency, as you very well uh, mentioned, and as both uh, in the example that Angela described and you also cited, the need for a long term and long breaded practices or durations no? that need to be instituted. And, and recognize. Maybe the not yet um, as articulated by Munoz, but, uh, but also others, understood as a temporal vector that engages both uh, with the past and the production of potential and desirable futurities, but always in the future, in the present, you know, from a very situated uh, position. Maybe that's an adequate term to think and articulate this slow but incessant transformation or maybe other temporalities of the chronic that also makes us things in forms of, 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 um, of somatic practices that react to also forms of care, and, but also violence and, and others. I mean, in general, I think this claims or this asks us for, a, for, an, for new vocabularies no? to attest for this work. But maybe um, you want to actually reflect or react on this, this question of temporalities from this question. Angela, do you want to go first? Uh, I was just about to ask, you, you, you can respond first, we can alternate. Okay, uh, I'll begin and you just jump in. Is, is that okay? Um, so, so maybe I, I mean, I think we can talk about these things in a very theoretical way. Um, and, but also we have to think about them in the everyday practicalities of people who actually work in, in contemporary art centers. So I guess I would like to say, what is a temporality of no longer? So what are the things we actually urgently need to get rid of in order to make these places um, human friendlier and um, speech marks nature friendlier. Um, a lot of the working conditions are precarious. Um, they, they are based on, on, on short-term contracts or on, on labor conditions that reflect the project-based economy of the art field in general. So I'm not saying that the art centers are evil because they don't give out long-term contracts. I'm saying they find themselves operating under conditions of uh, project-based funding uh, logics that don't, that very often, at least from what I know, don't make it possible 
to actually have long-term employees. Um, so a certain, um, let's say, precarization and, and also um, that we cannot trust that we will have a job forever is very much part of the field. And, and it, it, it comes with different implications that have to do um, with, I would say, exhausting people, um, making them work very fast and very hard, uh, making them work more uh, in order to uh, harness the energy of more projects to get other projects. And that's a very unsustained, um, no, it's a very sustained, but very unsustainable mode um, of working. So, so I guess I would say, first, maybe one needs to understand what one doesn't want any longer in order to get rid of certain temporalities. Um, and, and maybe I'll stop here and maybe Angela wants to come in and then I can think of other things to say. Um, th th this is really so important, actually, the uh, prevalence of the project as a framework for production in the art world and um, how this exists within the, in relation to the competition principle. Um, I will start from, um, from a different uh, from a different point, um, a different scale maybe. Um, I know that a lot of things have been stressed about the archive, the narrativization of history, um, which are important tools to the feminist um, struggle. Um, personally, I would be critical of any lineage that focuses on individualism at this point, even in relation to this tool. And I think that, um, and I'm saying this because I know that because of the situation very soon, we're going to have a lot about displaced people. We're, go we're going to be dealing with um, um, histories of displacement um, at a rate and at a level that, that I don't think we, we, you know, art institutions have seen before and how these are going to be dealt with is, um, um, should not be on the individual level in my view at least. Um, now, for me, the principal struggle is I would say for decolonizing the concept of temporality um, that we use in feminism from that of a modernity of lateness and a modernity of developments. And if you go out there, if you leave this enclave where, you know, we talk amongst ourselves and we're very kind of like, you know, politically correct and theoretically whatever, and you go out there in the street, um, you, you will see that most people will talk about third world. They will talk about the modernity that hasn't come um, and a modernity that is at risk from those who are coming you know, to, to kind of like undermine it. Um, namely, there are Jews, the migrants from the wrong places. And we know um, of this discussion, certainly in Greece where I come from, they're very prevalent, but also elsewhere in Europe, the European Union. So the division is fictional. I think it is our task to, 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 to explain why development in one, in one part of the world is actually under development elsewhere. Um, this is certainly a feminist task because it does involve women. And by doing that, I think that we need to, uh, it, it's essential, it needs to happen with it, uh, that we remove art from the realm of leisure and the luxury of like spending time in an art institution looking at things. So I would say that um, today I'm at this point very skeptical about the very attractive ideas, nonetheless, of cyclical time that became very prominent in what I call postmodern idealism. And I know there's a revival today. I am afraid, and we see this every day even more, that death exists. And the arrow of time is what it is, which is why the loss of life during wartime or during the, the pandemic is a tragedy that is classed, that is racialized, that is gendered, and that can be blamed on specific material conditions. The climate destruction, they tell us the same story about the arrow of time. And scientific knowledge has given us enough tools here to see what, where we're headed in a very linear manner. So I think linearity <laughs> has been, um, for various reasons, kind of um, been you know, forgotten about. Or it got a bad name at some point, but I think um, I would personally, I feel quite attached to it. Uh, in, in relation to my feminist realism that I try to cultivate. <laughs> so 
um, for me, with feminism, we have the question of generations. Uh, we know that feminism uh, will not meet its goals during our lifetime. I mean, I don't know if anybody's like one year old here, but I think for the rest of us, <laughs> um, we live in the side of this knowledge, but we will still participate in the struggle. We will initiate the struggle. So the question, and this was actually very prominent. I remember uh, kind of like uh, reading about it um, in books of very important um, foundation, our historians at the time, uh, th this question of feminism as an intergenerational kind of um, uh, question and, and, and struggle. And there, um, and this comes from discussions um, we had with um, Elke recently, this is where the art institution comes in because it's also where choices are made about civilizational inheritance, okay? And the question of preservation. I don't know, LK. I mean, I've got a few more things to say, but this is this is actually a point that you stressed to me. So maybe you want to talk about that. So, so what we discussed, what Angela is referring to, we had a preparatory um, meeting, and we started speaking about um, so not so much contemporary art centers who very which very often don't have a collection, but but about museums that that have a deep storage. And, um, and in a way we could say um, they invest in the, in the prolongation of the lifetime of artworks via strategies that are called conservation and restoration. So, so when, when everything goes wrong, the climate in the museum is still good. When everything goes wrong, um, there, there is still, um, a lot of effort being made that um, the climate for the artworks is 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 all right, even if the humans are suffering. So I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, this this is in a in a way very paradoxical. And also, there's a lot of investment in um, in ensuring that that artworks are in good shape, um, to to put it colloquially. And we were speaking about so how is there a prioritization and that has a lot to do with temporalities which artworks get restored first and and which others are being let um, alone um, and left to their devices and how would we make our decisions based on um, ethical political moral criteria would we no longer restore um, fascist paintings or misogynist sculptures. Um, and, and so this is something that we speculated about. Um, so, so taking away time um, it is also a way of healing the wound to come back to the question that you asked at the very beginning and maybe um, investing time in, in restoring um, artworks um, or conserving them of the so-called marginalized positions. So it's not only about acquisition, that's what we talked about, but also about finding out what is actually there. And, and when we don't think about art museums, but, but more museums in general terms, like anthropological collections or historical collections, most museums don't even know what they have. So, 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 so they have no idea what, what they actually took. Um, so there's a lot of debate now in natural history museums that they actually have species in there that in our world outside, that is not the museum world, are already extinct. So the only way we can still find them, these species that we never got to know, um, is if we go to the deep storage of the Natural History Museum. And I think that's a lot to do with chronopolitical dimensions. So, so, so we are creating conditions for, for ecocide and um, the sixth uh, mass extinction. And some of this survives as dead collected species in the museum. And I think that gives a lot of food for um, feminist realism. Um, if I can just quickly add to that, um, is that yes, museums and archaeological museums, I used to be an archaeologist, an archaeologist in my you know, uh, 
very many years back <laughs> before moving on to contemporary art. I think that the, um, the basements of archaeological museums are not as traumatic for us as um, art museums. I mean, there's different, there's different kinds of history. There's a, there's a history to which we have uh, a proximity. There's other histories um, where we don't need to make the choice, which I think is a political choice, an extremely important one that we mentioned, um, LK. Uh, do we preserve you know, fascist works, for instance? And th this is, of course, a feminist issue. And th there was an amazing um, discussion, debate, very animated debate, actually, about Lenny Rimfestel in 1975 between, um, you know, uh, Susan Sontag, and Mars 1975, actually, and uh, Adrian Reitz. And if you read this, um, this debate about do, do we actually maintain women's work that is fascist? <laughs> which is more complicated because now we know that a lot of, uh, not, well, hopefully not a lot, but some uh, first wave feminists, they did, they, they, they were not just nationalists, but they actually became fascists, right? So we have very complicated um, histories. There are political choices that the closer you get to our moment, we can call them living histories, um, they can traumatize. I don't think anything can, traumatized me from the, you know, um, ancient Greek collection of the basement here, unless it's linked to territorial fighting that's going on now that has to do with displacement of populations and so on. So we are, and there we see again the arrow of time, we are a society that does have archaeology, not other societies didn't. And I think we, we, we need to be building on that. We need to understand the moments of difference and that, difference does exist. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much both for these very insightful remarks. Since we're only four minutes um, away from our time, and I also thankful for your, your very timely and, and timed contributions, maybe I would just um, want to wrap up this first conversations as I think there's many other traits, questions, and issues that will come up in the collective discussion at the end. So thank you very much, Angela and Elke. And in, for this, for summoning this feminist realism that I think it's going to continue in this in the next conversation and, and we will need to bring it back at the end. So if I can invite back on the screen, Elizabeth Levovici and Xavier Araki Sarakistain. Hello. 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 So in this second panel, um, we will move from the structural analysis uh, that uh, Angela and Elke provided very thoughtfully to discuss feminist methodologies, gestures, policies, positions and also forms of disobedience that can also provide concrete and situated examples to go beyond um, the dominant issue of representation uh, towards an understanding, but also an undertaking of feminism as a practice. No? The final question in the description of this conversation reads, reads, how might we curate feminist exhibitions and affront sex, gender, sexual identity, class and race inequalities in a manner that surpasses mere representation in institutional programs, something that actually also Angela and, and Elke have mentioned. But for this, we have to dive into these questions. I am very happy to welcome uh, uh, art historian and art critic, uh, critic and writer Elisabeth Lebovici, Hello. who is based in Paris. Hello. And curator Arakis, Xavier Arakistain, who's based in, Bil in Bilbao, although actually connecting from Vitoria Gasteiz. Hello, uh, good moment. afternoon. Hola, can you see me? We can. Fantastic. So maybe to let's just start this conversation getting hands on um, on the topic about maybe sharing some specific strategies, but also examples now from writing to curating to organizing, educating and more that help us in thinking this over overcoming of the representation topic that we have that has been dominant in the last decades. 
Who would like to start? Oh. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, Xavier. How are you? Fine. I'm in Vitoria because, you know, the Museum of Contemporary Arts of the Basque Country, Artium, is here in Vitoria. So I have another conversation with a fantastic artist uh, later on. So I'm connecting from Vitoria. And where are you? I'm in Paris. I'm in Paris right now in my, uh, well, in my place where I live and work, actually. And um, OK, I've been listening to everything that was said before. And I think it's, it's really interesting to, well, to, to try to practice what has been said. And I was particular. I mean, I was very emotional about a number of issues, but, um, you know, I, I'm not a curator, I'm an art critic, so I can only speak about the past, about things I've seen, huh? things that I've reflected upon, things I've seen, and not, you know, to kind of theorize um, a then and there of queer futurity, although I'd love that, but, you know, I'd leave that to Jose Esteban Munoz and many others. Um, and talking about, I was really, you know, the last, one of the last sentence of Angela was really interesting to me when, when she said that um, we had to think about the internal fractures of feminism, talking about you know, the relation of the plural of feminisms to the singular of feminism. And um, to, to, to go directly in our conversation, uh, our, yes. you know, um, there, there is a show that has been, uh, actually, I, I'd like to talk, talk about the structure of the show. Um, there is a show I've been particularly aware of that really changed actually my vision, vision of you know, what, ha what could be called historically French feminism. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit. It was the, the show was called Defiant Muses, uh, Delphine Serique and the Feminist Video Collectives in France, uh, 70s, 80s. And it was curated by Natasha Patricia Basles and Giovanna Zapperi. And I will make, make no, uh, you know, I will not hide that they are very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. And um, it, in fact, it was it was a joint venture that that um, was working with the materials of a, a very important center in Paris, to my a very feminist uh, center in Paris called Le Centre Audiovisuel Simone de Beauvoir, which is an archival center collecting uh, films and videos and documentation about um, mostly women, but certainly feminist uh, art makers and video makers and, and, um, and filmmakers uh, since 1982. So anyway, um, first of all, I have to say that uh, I'm sorry, the police is in my street. Um, so there's a lot, well, we are recalled to reality realism, as Angela would say. Um, what to me was really important is that, you know, first of all, this show didn't receive any kind of attention in France, I have to say. Huh? It's really important. Nobody wanted this show, okay? Except for one museum in Lille that actually hosted the show. And, uh, and then it went to the Reina Sofia, of course. And now it's going to the Kunsthalle in Wien and then probably to Stuttgart. Okay, it, with a long last, you know, that's talking about institutions. There was absolutely no museal institution in France that was interested. This is the backlash, you know, in France. Let's not think, you know, about the then and there. Let's think about what's happening now. Okay. Um, but second of all, I think that, you know, it was, uh, it was using a singular name, the name of Delphine Serig, you know, actress, activist, feminist, filmmaker, uh, producer, um, you know, as a kind of network to really rephrase two things and then I'll stop, okay. The first thing was that internal fracture of the feminist movement in France that was totally polarized for 50 years, I would say, you know, between Psyche-Po and the Mouvement des Femmes. They even went to trial against each other, okay. That was totally different in their approach of feminism. And, you know, okay, we won't talk about that, but this is a show that didn't give a shit about that and really went over this kind of fracture, trying maybe to repair it. And the second thing 
and you'll forgive my French, my English, uh, is, um, is the fact that the show um, rephrased totally what one could understand by French feminism. You know, that feminism of text, that theoretical feminism that, that, the, um, that you can gr see growing from Hélène Sixou to Julia Kristeva to um, Lucie Rigaray to Michel Montrelet and so on and so forth. Um, it was much more thinking back, by the way, of a materialist feminism and a materialism that was a producer of visuals and of images, and that was thinking beyond its boundaries, uh, linking towards the South, uh, linking towards the diasporas, linking towards uh, giving, you know, filming and giving cameras to um, to women all, you know, not all over the world, but in certain part where oppression was at, at its uh, utmost point. So it was really rethinking this whole idea of French into a kind of francophone um, feminism, and then also really putting the accent on the networks of, produce, of production that would include uh, people uh, feminist at each level at it, of its uh, production, from production to distribution to for to criticism to uh, so I think it was a really interesting show about that. And I don't want to take you know it too much. Well, I was happy. I was uh, lucky enough to see the the show in Madrid, and uh, as you know, we also did while I was. Uh, directing Montermosa, we did a program with uh, Saint Simon de Beauvoir. So we, uh, I was familiar with the movies, and and I think it's very important what you're saying from a French perspective, how the show was reframing what what French feminism is. Uh, you know, I'm um, uh, well. Let's see how I how do I explain this. I've been, I've been shocked for 25 years to see how uh, Idia Garay, Kristeva, and Sisu have been coined the French feminist theories in America. And then from America, it has spread to the world. So, you know, and at the same time, Nicole Claude Mathieu, Christine Delphi, Colette Guichemin, Paula Tabet, Monique Wittig. Monique Wittig, they were all buried in some, for, you know, in oblivion, you know, <laughs> and um, that was, a, that was, this is what, one of the reasons we already, we also did this um, film and video program in Montermoso, and this is why I celebrated so much the exhibition you're talking about by Natasha Petreshin, and, um, and, well, that was a, I was very surprised that the Reina Sofia accepted this because you know uh, they are not very much into feminism. But um, but um, I was lucky enough to see the show, and I think uh, you are absolutely right. I think it, it is a very important important show. Also, I would like to say a couple of things before we go on to another shows, um, Elizabeth, because. I think the, the name of the talk is that this time we talk about gender. And um, Elke and Elke has already talked about this a little bit, but I want to point out that it's, it's starting to be very irritating, you know, to, um, um, to realize that gender equals women. And not only gender is not, it's not um, quoted as an analytical category. You know, yes, equaling women. So if you're talking about gender, you're talking about women. And if you're talking even about feminism, a feminist issue now is, you know, it's things about women instead of um, what feminism, we all know what fe real feminism is, is to talk, um, it's not about women issues. It is about denouncing social sexual relations that produce the discrimination, the oppression, and the exploitation of women by men. So any, you know, if you put on those glasses and you look at the world from that perspective, that is feminism. It's not only about, you know, women issues. And um, I think that's very important that we, that we um, underline these questions because as this French, um, sorry, Spanish feminist philosopher Celia Moros says, 
conceptualize is to politicize. So it's, you know, we should have very clear concepts, you know, to politicize well from a feminist perspective. So I just wanted to drop these two things on the table. <laughs> and also, um, I'm very excited that this is organized by a French uh, organization, although there is some other uh, centers from other countries um, supporting and taking part on it, because, um, because of this uh, genealogy of French feminism starting with Simone de Beauvoir. She did not write the second gender, she wrote the second sex. And I, I'm stressing this because I also want to point out that unfortunately nowadays, not only gender and sexual identity, race or ethnicity or even age, but also sex is still operating um, as a social category that produces discrimination, exploitation, and even killing of women, you know, and we should be very aware of this because gender and sex are not the same thing. And, um, and we were also the other day, uh, Elizabeth talking about uh, intersectionality being one of the characteristics of nowadays, nowadays feminism. And of course that uh, uh, the French materialists already you know, knew that sex, gender, sexual identities, race, ethnicity, class, age, they are all intertwined at, and they operate at the same time. So we know, you know, it doesn't, they doesn't happen in a vacuum by themselves. So it's all, you know, mixed up. So we need to, to think, you know, all these uh, categories, how they operate and they sum up together. And um, I would like to bring out, uh, bring up another, another exhibition maybe. Uh, that you were talking about the other day, because I know that you have seen it also, Women in Abstraction. Yeah. I think, I don't know where it was shown in Paris, but I saw it at, at, the, Pompidou. The, at the Pompidou. I saw it at the Guggenheim Bilbao. Well, it's still on, I think. And I was thinking, um, if you, what I just said about gender and feminism, if you look from a feminist perspective, what that show is doing, you know, is Women in Abstraction. Well, and I don't know how it was installed in, in, in Paris, but in Bilbao, there was, you know, like the whole floor was full up with different art pieces. And in a small between, there were all these um, foundational um, feminist theoretical books, all, you know, kept in a cage, you know, in a vitrine. And, I, I was so annoyed, it was so irritating. And I immediately thought of this show as opposed to one that I saw at the, at the Tate Modern, maybe you saw it, the friend, the, the wall goes pop. Do you see the wall goes pop? That was another show, that was the okay. show that Jessica Morgan curated uh, under Francis Morris um, direction. And I think there are two opposite ways of doing uh, shows related to women and feminism. Um, uh, the Wall Goes Pop was a show about men and women artists. It didn't exclude women artists as a, another category. You know, it, it didn't put them apart. It wasn't an only women show. It wasn't a show of um, pop art, women artists. It was a show about pop art. It was a show about rethinking what pop art is. It was, you know, the world goes pop. And in that, in that uh, operation, they research a lot. They get in touch with different teams of researchers in different countries. And for instance, they have Marie Chorda, this Spanish, uh, this Spanish um, pop painter. That she, you know, and that was so embarrassing for the institutions in Spain. You know, the Tate Modern has curated a woman, a woman artist that we don't pay any attention to in Spain, you know. That was very uplifting, it embarrassed the, the museums in Spain. I think it was a very good way of doing a feminist show. And also didn't um, produce this thing, which I, this symptom, what I think is very problematic, th that um, uh, putting the women apart always 
ends up being a subcategory from my perspective. You know, if you do a only women show, at the end it's a, a like a, if you only do a black um, artist show, it's a black art show, it's a women's show, it's a subcategory. And, you know, we're still going to, to be operating between um, the canon, what the canon is, and then the subcategories, which are, you know, in that canon occupying a specific position. So I think that that is um, a good comparison of two ways of curating shows, because um, if you if you talk, if you reduce feminism to things done by women, as in the Guggenheim and the Pompidou show, show um, you are depoliticizing feminism. Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, the former panel, this panel was about this, uh, this type of uh, the, the winning in a way of a type of liberal um, feminism in, in, uh, within the arts world, which we shouldn't, uh, you know, dismiss because it's, it is obvious. Uh, and, um, you, you know, yesterday in, in, the, uh, in the newspaper, um, the, the virtual newspaper, I will say there was a very interesting article by Joan Scott about the backlash of uh, gender studies from Hungary, I should say, to, to France. And, um, and it was really important the way she stressed a number of essential programs uh, that uh, feminism and gender studies have produced in terms of knowledge production. She was referring to situated knowledges, interdisciplinary practices, critical thinking and ethical engagement. And she was really stressing out how much these type of um, possibilities that were opened by, by gender studies. And I would say also in exhibitions, we could apply it to exhibition very well. The, the notion of situated knowledge, by the way, how do you apply that you know, within an art institution? I think it would be a really interesting thing to discuss the idea of the notion of interdisciplinary practices. How is that practiced you know, in an institution? Uh, the critical thinking at work, you know, in the, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that Julia and Elfie, you're here. And, uh, you know, I know a few of, your sh of the shows you have organized. I knew a, a number of things you have organized. And I was really, you know, um, very, very moved by the fact that, for instance, Elfie, you read Monique Wittig, you read Les Guerrières by Monique Wittig, that, you know, and, and, the, and the, the exhibition programs was not, were not a consequence of reading Monique Wittig, but were a way to situate your practice of making in, in ex, exhibitions in relation to a critical reading. And, uh, and the notion of ethical engagement, I think also is so important in, uh, in making exhibitions. And all of that is very much being challenged today. And one shouldn't forget that, you know, everywhere from Russia and, the, and Ukraine to, to, even to France, where one should say, I mean, and repeat, you know, that under the name of Islamo-leftism, as they say, you know, a whole, you know, a whole body of work right now in the university is being disclaimed by this government we have. So I think it's very important. And maybe I would like to ask, you know, what thing I was also, I'm also very much um, um, aware that, uh, again, in, in the last conversation, it was very much stressed the issues of labor in a feminist practice in an art institution, the way indeed uh, everybody, you know, from the people to, who clean, to the people who guard, to the people who are uh, involved into making exhibition, to the secretaries who are actually making the loan forms and doing the uh, kind of ho the homework of the institution, to the administration, all that has also a, a place and a working to do in feminist, in feminist practice. I think also you know, it's uh, as a consequence of uh, these these um, these programs. Um, people have been more aware of the conditions of labor of everybody in the institution, and I'm very much. I think it's also a way to think about exhibitions. Is also to think about 
to think about exhibitions with the notion that everybody should not be precarious and that everybody should think about their labor conditions and that should be part of the show, as well as what has really, really annoyed me in Les Fa Elles Font Abstraction, women and, the Women in Abstraction uh, exhibition is that there is, there is never any case of suppression or forgetting. There's no holes, there's no fracture in those shows. And this really, really is very problematic to me. Huh? The idea, there, there was, a, okay. No, well, I, I, I have this image of a telephone listing that has 2000 names and you don't know what to do with that. I mean, it's, perf it's perfect in, a, in, in a making and creating an empty space, vacuum. I mean, a telephone listing communicates nothing. A telephone listing, what is that? What is the criteria? Where is the, you know, where is the discourse? So, and this is not the only show, unfortunately, that is doing telephone listings, you know, like, look, see what, how many women did this and that, and there goes another telephone listing. And somebody, uh, you know, is specialized in a specific country or in a specific period. And there goes the telephone listing. And that I think is okay when Anne Sutherland Harris and Linda Nockling did that show in the early 80s, you know, it was important to visualize the, the, the work of women artists. It is still is important to visualize the, the, the work of women artists, but we need to think from a feminist perspective, not only about the exhibitions, but to think from a feminist perspective about art. And feminism, is a vindication since its um, enlightened origin in France by, by the way, men and women, François Poulain de Lavar, Olam de Gouche, Condorcet, John Stuart Mill. You know, feminism is a thing that um, is um, a political perspective, uh, a, field, a theory, a field of knowledge that has been developed not only by women, but also by men. And this is also, you know, nobody talks about this at all recently, we are, I think, uh, going through a new period of essentialization. Is, is that the word in, in English? And, you know, like today is the 8th of March and my friend Lourdes Mendez was telling me that in, her, in the faculty, she was teaching this morning, these uh, people were saying that only um, to, to be a feminist, you have to be a woman, you know, like people in their 20s. It is, this is a disgrace, you know, that we, we don't know our history. We don't know, you know, what has happened in the past. We are condemned to repeat, you know, to start from the very beginning and to commit the same mistakes. You know, of course we have a problem in the transmission of feminist knowledge from one generation to another. Um, some of us are pre very preoccupied with this issue and we have been, you know, doing what we can about it, organize courses, write in different places, you know, to talk, tell the stories and to pass on from, you know, one generation to the other one. But I think we should stress that uh, also in the shows, you know, this, this uh, point should be taken into account, the transmission of feminist knowledge and uh, not only the telephone listings. Maybe if I can intervene here, because I think that you've both made a very powerful point that as also Elizabeth had shared with us before in the, in the conversations prior to this, um, to this panel, that it's not the same to actually organize an exhibition on women artists or even feminist content, content but at Hel as Helen Mollesworth uh, claims to actually install and organize exhibitions as a feminist, no? And maybe like uh, towards this, the end of this, uh, the conversation, I would like to invite you to, to think, to speculate, but also to share in your case, Arakis, how um, should a feminist contemporary art institution be? You know? How should it perform? How should it organize, structure, and speak? Maybe you can share some of the concrete examples regarding content, but specifically also structure that you put into place and Elizabeth, also, you can reflect on it. Um, 
Well, uh, I would like to say one thing before that, um, because you know this. You train... always want to say one thing before that, Arakis. <laughs> <laughs> the thing before the other one. I, I was reading the other day an article by Lourdes Mendes, and she was because we, I am. Um, I was invited by the French government, by the Ministry of Culture, I think, from France in 2007 to meet people and to see different institutions. And I asked if I could meet Francoise Collin, and she was extremely kind, and she received me at the Beaubourg, and we have a very surrealistic conversation because I was so happy to come into the country of Simone de Beauvoir, and I thought that you know everybody was going to be a feminist, and she told me, are you crazy? Nothing is happening here since you know uh, 1989 or something, she said. And anyway, but I'm bringing up Francoise Collin because she, um, she had this reflection um, this, that relates feminism and art. She said that she, talk, uh, she spoke about two effects, the effect Beauvoir and the Duchamp effect. And the Beauvoir effect, she said, it takes place outside of the art world, in politics. For example, you can apply sex quotas in, in institutions, in shows, wherever, you know, in the parliament. You can apply some of the tools that operate in society. You can use them in the art world, but they come from the outside. So that would be what she calls the Beauvoir effect, you know, to do some interventions from outside the art world. But the problem she was saying, I mean, they were, and she was very happy that I was at the time doing Montermoso and she was, do, she was telling me that's fantastic that you are taking into account quotas, you know, num numbers, figures. And, um, but there is a problem, uh, what, she, what, what she calls the Duchamp effect is somebody can say what is art and what is not art. And to do that, you have to have the authority to do that. And that is what she, she, what she calls the Duchamp effect. And women do not have or have not had in historically that authority, that power to say what is art and what is not art. And she was saying, we have to think about the Duchamp effect. You know, we have to develop strategies that, that uh, will permeate the, the art world and I was also, I mean, I'm mean very much into, into France, into France today. I, I also always think about the charismatic ideology that, that Pierre Bourdieu, the charismatic ideology of art that Pierre Bourdieu was, um, has been, you know, one of his um, uh, few, what's the word in, in English? One of his statements. Or, um, and um, I also think about Griselda Pollock saying, can art survive, can art history survive feminism? Because uh, I think in the, in the, to think from a, from a feminist perspective, we have to think on, uh, from the Beauvoir effect, from the Duchamp effect, but we also have to think that what is going on nowadays in, in the art world is like an empire of art history. It's all about art history. Art history is supposed to be the only discipline that can say what is art and what is not art. So sociology, philosophy, anthropology, you know, all those uh, sciences, they, are, they, should, they should shut up. And this is why I was re reading this article in French. I, maybe there is a, a also, um, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say, the title in, in, in French. Histoire et politique, l'histoire de l'art, tu le subis, of feminism. In Feminism, Art et Histoire de l'art, Paris, Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Beaux Arts, 1994. This is where I read this, um, this text by Griselda Pollock saying that also what you have been mentioning uh, before, that, um, that knowledge, that uh, um, um, power, the situ you were saying about talking about positioning situated discourses, and that speaking is also sit positioning yourself in a place, and 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 that is related to power, 
and that um, that we have to question art history from a feminist perspective in order to um, delve into the Duchamp effect that Francois Collin says. This is what I think. You know, there is a long comment by Griselda Pollock. So Griselda, would you like to read it? Can you? Is that possible? Oh, yeah. I think this Maybe. is a, the, the structure uh, doesn't allow uh, okay. for the public to actually come into the screen. So Griselda, I'm so sorry, but I will, um, oh, it is not public. I will try, I will read it for you. Uh, thank you for these great conversations. You're right to denounce the telephone listing kit of shows that assemble names, this time women. I order to identify stylistic trends or choices of materials or approaches. This is precisely an example of partial and official exploitation of the topic of women artists by the institutions, which by doing this so conventionally silence in uh, majuscule and erase in capital letters, 50 years of feminist challenges to the models of art history itself as discourse. The radical change of feminist theory cannot be digested by the institutions and hence we arrive at this contradiction. I feel this process of silencing feminist theory constantly, even all your speakers and myself included, have put this eloquently into the world in many volumes, articles, exhibition. This is a real war against all forms of radical theory and the practices such theory inspires. Well, thank you very much, Griselda. <laughs> Yeah, I think we should all yeah go into general discussion after that, yes. isn't it? Please. Yes, let's, I mean, we were scheduled to finish a bit later. So maybe, but we can start with the discussion while Elke slowly comes back. Right. So there was a question pending of the feminist institution that, well, maybe we'll leave it for another time because there's also another question by Antonio Cataldo <clears throat> that I'm going to okay. read to all of you. It says, thank you so much for such brilliant presentations. I wanted to go back to Elke and ask about the marginalized majority. Isn't it dangerous to speak about the marginalized majority? We recently closed an exhibition curated by Queer World here in Oslo, an organization working for queer minorities. Although one may understand the concept of a marginalized majority, there are minorities in need of recognition and gaining a voice that the majority of society is still not recognizing. Does that concept risk creating problematic non-recognition? So I think this is not actually in contradiction with each other. I was just speaking about the fact that uh, the, the, so when we talk about people being marginalized, they, they are actually not marginal in numbers. That's what I was referring to. But, but the marginalized make up, like in economic and material terms, make, make up the majority of people inhabiting the planet. That's what I was trying to, um, to stress. Um, and I was not talking about specific um, minorities um, when I said that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a suggestion. Would you like to comment on the brochure that we sent to everybody? You know, that purple thing with the title, the pictures, our pictures, our bios. Would you, do you think it's a good idea to talk about that? I think can, it would be a very good idea. Yeah. Can we, can we see it? Because I, I think it's a picture of Angel, uh, Angela Dimitrakaki, and then it's Elke Krasny. And then it's me, and then it's you, and then it's Julia, and then it's Marielene, I think. And I think we have been organized by age. Darling, I think you and I are the oldest ones in, in the oh, room all over. All I'm of certainly us, the older. All of us, father, we are the old ones. And I thought it was very funny. Can, can we put it on the screen so we can all see it? No, but I think like people can, you can refer it because it's on the website. Okay. But it's organized by panels and by the conversations that uh, were structured. But you know, when I, when I received the invitation, I was on my computer with the big screen in my house and I was going, well, this is like a poster, you know, it's, um, 
um, uh, some images, some text, some colors, and graphic design. And I thought that I don't know what did you what did you feel when you received it, Angela? Um, do you remember? I do. I, I do remember. Uh, I I don't remember what I thought. That I, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, I thought it was the panel. But um, anyway. Um, yeah, I thought it was the two panels that were that we were arranged as panels. That was my first impression. Um, um, but um, are we sorry? I did. I did I interrupt you, Eric. It's like ca 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 carry on and no, no, yeah, no. Okay. I'm, I'm, I was because I wanted. I wanted to. I wanted to um, bring back the, um, the the text, the message. I mean, Griselda's intervention and link yes. it. Yes, let's go back. It. Okay. And link okay. it to something that you said, and also thank you very much um, for, for this very vital um, discussion. Um, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I, I will actually defend <laughs> on this occasion. Um, women artists and exhibitions of women artists, um, because... I don't mean that this should be repeated forever, but there is a certain historicity which really demanded the construction of women artists as a political category. Yes. That's one thing I would yes. say. I remember, and I think Griselda's own um, radical theory was when I was a student, a huge, it had a huge impact, absolutely, on me. Like it really started me thinking. But the other thing, I want to address this broader uh, question <coughs> of. Because I, I agree and I have written, you know, publicly about like, um, you know, departing from the women artists uh, exhibition, feminism is not that and so on. Um, obviously, we, we can't fit everything into a two hour discussion. But I think yeah. that what we should need to differentiate is what we think. And we're feminists, you know, we're very trained. <laughs> we're very different to other people. Very different. <laughs> what we think that feminism should be about and how or what women is or what gender is or what men, you know, so and how these concepts function out there. When I go out after I leave here, I and mean, I was checking my phone before, so this big trans feminist, um, um, what you call it, like um, placard that my friends are having downtown and so on. Um, and at the same time, what did the Ukrainian government said? It said women and children can go, men are not allowed to leave the country. And so how um, gender functions in, in the world, if you will, than in our own trained selves, right? I think it's a very different, it's a very different thing. It's part of the struggle, but I think that um, when, and, the, and there were extremely, I would say sophisticated exhibitions that looked, uh, that were not about putting, you know, women artists into history. I think this this, this uh, got out of the window relatively early in some quarters because for reasons already answered by Linda Nochling in that <laughs> very early paper. But th there was, you know, the construction precisely of a different um, temporality or chronology or um, a kind of lineage of modernity that would be different because a terrible wrong had been done to, to a gender as understood that at that point, I don't know, it was also a sex or whatever. So what I'm saying is that I think all these things, we, we don't need to prioritize. I think the problem is when limiting ourselves, uh, not me because I'm not a curator, uh, but like when, <laughs> for instance, no, no. in real practice, we limit ourselves to, um, to one particular goal um, that the problem arises. Sorry. and. I, Stop. <laughs> no, I, I thought I totally agree with you, but you know, in the two things I'd like to say, you know, as I think Griselda was saying, you know, a lot of these list exhibitions um, totally eradicate scholarship. Huh? Everything is presented as new, as discovery, and the um, I, I I watched the reaction of the people who were super interested, for instance, as. The, at this uh, women and abstraction show, there were really people were genuinely staying very long and looking at it, etc. It's all about you know giving uh, giving a sort of um, de um, de centered position, which is totally devoid of 
any kind of scholarships and any kind of conflict and any kind of erasure and any kind of failure, you know, and again, going back and I know you make an you made an argument for chronology I was very I, I think we should talk about that because I was very interested in that argument about linear chronology we've been all fighting so much I know and, uh, I know I'm just but <laughs> yeah so I'd like you to speak about that actually because I'm very interested you know in that contradiction you know in to our you know general discourse so but um that was a linear chronological show and I think it really didn't use any kind of tool to make again, you know, the 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 knowledge situated a bit to, to make it more of an interdisciplinary problem, give a you know produce a kind of critical thinking, and then have a certain ethical engagement as as you, to go back to Joan Scott's little thing. Uh, but can we go back to linear chronology? I'm very interested about that. Uh, I don't know. I just can we do we have time in our linear two hours <laughs> to do this um i'm not so sure uh but the, for me the question actually of um the, the question of gender feminism about gender rather than about women is for me very interesting and we really need to 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 reflect on this without necessarily i know a lot has been has been written but um, and said and so on. But for me, it's a very open, it's a very open issue where I don't have answers. Um, I just read and think, and um, so it's it, it's it's a huge subject, right? much bigger than the one about time. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Which is also big. Um, I and I always self censor myself in in, in many ways. Um, there are words that. When I read the word radical in Griselda's <laughs> in Griselda's text, it was like radical theory, you know. And if you put feminist there in the middle, you have something that um, you know uh, trans communities don't don't like very much. So there is we have so, but I don't think this should be part of this two-hour discussion here. But we shouldn't assume that we, um, you know, that we I don't think about them very hard. I want to recommend Angela. I want to recommend to the people that is that is listening mm -hmm. one book, *L'Anatomie Politique* by Nicole Claude uh, Mathieu. That is, it was published very much at the same time of *Gender Trouble* by Judith Butler, and I think it's a very interesting reading. Um, I don't speak French, but I have a French friend that translates some things for me, and uh, also um, there are some some. Part of it are translated into Spanish um, by Julia Falque and Oriel Cucci. So the Spanish speaking audience maybe can read bits of it. And the French audience, of course, is in French. L'anatomie politique, Nicole Claude Mathieu. I think she does a fantastic description, description from the anthropology, uh, point from the from anthropology, a, um, a very precise description of the relationships between sex, gender, and sexual identities, and how they operate in different cultures. In the, in, in, and I think it is not being surpassed since the 90s. I haven't read anything that I, you know, that has surpassed that. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I used to be able to read France, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> in literary time, I think I've lost. Uh, you know, the skill, despite my status of many years. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth, to address the question of like time, um, mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that the climate destruction to begin from that, now we also have um, a very conspicuous um, nu nuclear threat. <laughs> if I can, and I don't mean just recently, also in relation to energy, even if this kind of energy could not be used in weapons, uh, very recently in, in Britain, there was this leap uh, in terms of uh, nuclear technology about how we're going to have new, you know, an amazing amount of energy, which is nuclear. So, um, so, so I think that there is, uh, th there is finitude and that we, I can't think of it um, differently. And it's, I think it's on the base of this finitude that we, that we act. I think that 
when we can when it comes to politics, I think that the, the different generations um, are the futurity. <laughs> so we, we can't function because this project, this project, you know, feminism is much bigger <laughs> than our lifetimes and yes. um, much bigger than singular lifetimes. And it needs to be seen. It's, it's a big project of uh, humanity and beyond humanity. And I think that this is not in contrast with uh, linear time, which was associated with uh, the messianism of, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> a certain reading of, of modernity um, and the idea of progress, which I, I would contest that all moderns thought like this. I think it was a more complex uh, think. I think if we think even about revolutionary time, we arrive at a more complex uh, question. And we can certainly reread Kristeva. <laughs> um, yeah. in, okay. and, uh, yes. And of course, so we have never been modern. Bruno Latour's We Have Never Been Modern, which is also an argument uh, that we yes. could share. Yes, yes. Um, I, I would certainly agree with, with that. I mean, I would, that, and I remember that also. I mean, one of my primary texts about modernity is actually about Griselda Pollock or modernism rather in, in the book Framing Feminism, which I uh, bring with me <laughs> to various places where I go, you know, uh, for sabbatical because I tend to return to it. And um, then there's another text which is very influential for me about the possibility of abolishing the idea of modernity through the revolution, which is by um, a British um, historian um, Perry Anderson in New Left Review. And I kind of like read, you know, these texts uh, sometimes together, but arriving at the synthesis <laughs> is still hard, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. And it does need to be realized. I mean, that's the thing, it's liberating to think of feminism as a project that's bigger than us. Totally. Totally. I think it's <laughs> absolutely that's a thank you that's a very <laughs> optimistic idea I'm never an optimist but uh, due to the circumstances <laughs> but Angela what you were saying I always remember this annex well this another Spanish phil feminist philosopher Amelia Valcarcel saying that it took more than two generations to get the vote for women you know so uh we have to be as feminists, we have to be very aware of what you're saying, that feminism is, in the, is a long uh, career. It, it's, well, maybe that's not the correct word. It's a long process. It's going to revolution. It's going to take some, some hundreds of years or whatever. And we are only here for how long? 80? Maybe <laughs> 70, 80? It depends. That's right. <laughs> or, or how many drugs you take. Uh, I mean, so we have to be very aware from, you know, from a feminist perspective to think that we are here for a while. I, I'm already 50, 56, and I always thought that my, my role is to uh, pass to the next generation what I've learned from the previous one, you know, and that's about it. <laughs> Ah, well, you know, I like guess us Gen Xers um, are in a very particular historical position. Um, those of us who are now like between 45 and, you know, kind of like late 50s, um, because we endured the trauma of a certain disintegration. Um, the book, you know, this very famous novel, Generation Next, it had as its title, nobody remembers this, Tales for an Accelerated Culture, right? And here we are. So, um, so I think we have a very particular kind of um, mediating, we, we, yeah, history. And we never took ourselves uh, seriously because of drugs, or I don't know what. <laughs> we we have a long childhood, <laughs> very long childhood, <laughs> you know. And um, we 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 have been very hesitant in becoming adults. And I have been personally absolutely intimidated by, in one conversation I had with Griselda, I think my only one, um, when I realized how young she was when she was writing that theory. <laughs> and um, th this is actually very important, how we think of our, you know, how we think of, our, of ourselves generation. But I want also to clarify something. I'm not sure that, it's a luxury for me to, to be able to think about generation in these terms. I think that the disaster, the climate disaster, the nuclear disaster, the war disaster and so on, 
uh, make me speak more about when I say generation, I mean, people who live under the threat at the same time, irrespective mm -hmm. of how like a historical generation with something I've, I've written about a few years back. Um, so there's different ways of like thinking about it. I know there was a, a lot of psychoanalysis about, you know, the mother daughter relationship and everything. Um, we can keep talking about it. The one thing certain is that feminism will live, I hope it's certain, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, will exist after us. Maybe if I can jump in here, Please. because I think yeah. I, I agree that the maelstrom of time can, can be, can take us forever. And, and also just to mention uh, very important uh, contributions by decolonial feminist thinkers now on this subject, which Definitely. as you were mentioning, Angela, that actually broaden our perspective of how there's multiple um, time temporalities and times coexisting, but there's just like one that has been hegemonically imposed over the others. Um, well, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, Quijano, many, many uh, contribute to this. But I want to actually take two questions that have been posed. I'm going to read them both together to share them with the, with the floor or, or the screen to respond. The first one comes from Harriet Williams from, from Nantes Université, Université Catholique de l'Ouest in Angers. So um, Harriet agrees with the idea of telephone listening that we see of women artists in exhibitions, but how, she asks, can we avoid this? How can we go further? That's on the one hand. And the other comment and question comes from Min Leng, who is grateful for the interesting talks, and the question or confusion is that they feel that it's very difficult for feminism to be separated from binary lenses. They are very concerned about the antipathy from other groups. Is it really because they don't dig into feminism research? For many times, the topic will always go back to the discourse between men and women and lack solidarity from other groups of people, including men. Should we rethink the term femininity from post-structuralism perspective? As femininity is a word constructed by patriarchy society, those patriarch attributes femininity to women. However, this care personality may be a part of human being nature. So the so-called femininity should be abandoned and find a neutral world. Considering some feminists want to create a new world beyond patriarchy society, a care world, some men think they will not have a role in this new world because they are criticized of being aggressive and care is not part of them. Okay. Um. <laughs> Sorry, there's a second part to the question that just arrived. And also in terms of LG, LBGTQAI, people, how we consider whether they have this nature of femininity. We need to take the strength from all group of people. So we need to take from the same stance, which is anti-patriarchism or patriarchality. But we don't have the power yeah. to enforce all this. <laughs> we really don't. We can change these things within our theoretical perspective. I can tell you very anthropologically that um, research doing in some groups, um, um, here in town, you know, um, kind of like male identified um, groups. There's one who is the woman of the week and the woman in that particular week, this rotates, um, the woman who is not, you know, um, a woman by sex, like she cooks, she's available for sex and so on. This is an anthropological observation. And when you look at the, uh, global um, data that we've got, you will see that there is a lot of unpaid labor since we started with this, which is done um, by women that saves capitalism trillions <laughs> and trillions like, you know, annually. So whether we have, I mean, we can write about theoretically, we can argue about these things, but in the world of kind of like established gender, where gender plays actually an economic role, you will see that it's extremely hard uh, to, to, to move things. And so this is, this is what, how, what I would answer. Um, 
I just remember an article by Juliette Michel that she wrote the year I was born, 1966, Women, the Longest Revolution. I will tell that person that maybe he or she can find that um, article. It was published in the New Left Review. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying that right, yes. Uh, I don't know, I think, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting text. Women, the Longest Revolution, Juliette Michel. Um, okay, I, I have an, a historical answer to um, maybe, I think it's also, you know, I was very struck by the Monique Wittig's project, which was to deconstruct the categories, by the way, of men, you know, man, woman, femininity, masculinity, uh, under all that being um, the product of heteropatriarchy, white patriarchy. And the answer, in a way, but was what she called le chantier littéraire, giving a form, giving a project to that deconstruction. A chantier, a work, you know, a work in progress, a work in process, I would say, a process, a process being given a form. And maybe there's something to, well, to think about since we are amongst people who make exhibitions, who makes forms, who make, you know, who are interested by this idea of process, the chantier. Uh, mm -hmm. This idea of working towards giving form, whatever you might think, you know, by the word form, to something, a language idea. And maybe that's, that would be my answer, you know. And it would go back to the second question, which is how do you do without doing a, a telephone listing um, of women artists to do a, a feminist show? I think it's the question of um, looking at an exhibition as a as a chantier, as mm -hmm. something that has to be given a form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's beautiful. I think yeah. I would I would like to connect this question that that is written in the chat here that um, talks about um, men not being part of this time to come, of men being excluded from the world of care. Um, I would like to take it back to what we discussed about time. Um, before, because it's a very time-oriented question. I mean, as if as if there were no time for men left in the future. Um, <laughs> and, um, oh, so, how um, nice! Um, I, I think so much has been thought about the social production of space, which is, of course, also the title of a book by Henri Lefebvre. But there is no book that is called the social production of time or the very anti-social production of time. And, um, and uh, the way in which the enormous amount of uncounted hours that Angela just talked about, the hours that do not count um, in terms of money, um, the care hours, they, they actually make possible that there is time left, the time we call future, because if we stop caring, um, then, then we are not um, contributing to any kind of um, continuation. So, so it's not really an answer about the role of men, but I, if I may think out loud, for me, this is not the right question. It, it, the question is, how can we become beings that, that have time and resources to care so, so that, like John Tronto says, we become free to care and we are not um, forced to care. And if we no longer just assume that one gender is assigned the labor of care by um, birth, um, th th then I think we can think differently how, how making futures um, might take place. And anecdotally, I want to share something that people said yesterday evening when we had a book presentation and afterwards we were standing out in the cold. So it's very cold in Vienna now, but we of course, um, COVID, we try to be um, COVID conforming. So, so we stand in the cold and talk. And there was a very young, I mean, young vis-a-vis -vis me, there was a very young person and, um, and they said, um, 
we do things to change the world, but we may not be here to actually um, benefit from them. And, and she was very young and she said, we do this for others. And I think very often we only talk about the things that we have done to ruin the planet. I mean, so all the things that, um, that we have a differentiated responsibility toward. And I thought it was a very beautiful thought to start thinking and maybe even make an exhibition about the things people have been doing for those others they don't even know because they are in the future. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you. It, it's, I don't wanna be kitschy or sound nostalgic or anything. I think it was actually a very materialist concern that was being uttered yesterday. The things we do with people and beings in mind, we don't know. And that, that goes beyond the, the kinds of connections where we only feel connected with those with whom we have ties because we are similar. Thank you very much, Elke, for this last reflection, which I think it's actually a good uh, wrap-in uh, comment for our session today. Also, as I'm, as I'm aware, then many of us need to engage with other commitments and or specifically hit the streets for to join the mobilizations and demonstrations happening everywhere. But I would like to actually end up with this note to actually relaunch another form of not only responsibility, but actually co-responsibility, uh, feminist co-responsibility from the practices that we entail from this field work or chantier no, that Elizabeth was referring to as this everyday um, practice and thinking of, of, of feminist working, of transformation in our practices that refer to the cultural and artistic reorganization and resignification of history, of experience, thinking as well as institutions so um maybe just a final note and may this i mean may today the 8th of march and every day be a, a moment to claim a wider and wilder uh, feminist world thank you very much to everyone to participating speaking hearing commenting and asking questions and i'm looking forward to the next sessions to be also organized Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And especially, specifically, huge uh, thanks to the translators that were very hands on uh, trying to grasp everything that we were saying. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao.